Jordan Shoemaker, who is working on her Master of Historic Preservation degree at the College of Environment and Design from the University of Georgia, while working also as a preservation intern at the Northeast Georgia Regional Commission in her spare time. Jordan is a native, native Athenian, and she loves Athens and the Georgia Bulldog as, as much as any person you will ever meet. Um, and she's already known in the historic preservation circles. Um, she was a Watson Brown Junior Board member and worked closely with the TRR Cobb House. And she was an intern at the Athens Clark Heritage Foundation, working at our Athens Welcome Center. She has also been involved in the Beach Haven Restoration Project. Today, she's going to talk to us about intangible preservation, the practices, expressions, knowledge, and skills, as well as the associated objects that communities recognize to be part of their cultural heritage. After our program, you can get samples of chicken mull um, out in the hall, courtesy of the Butt Hut on Macon Highway and Iris Place. Um, the Butt Hut is the only restaurant, or maybe there are others, the only one we know about that serves chicken mull on the menu every single day. Um, our thanks to them. And now, please welcome Jordan Shoemaker. I never put much thought in the chicken mall until I was sitting in a classroom in Oxford, Mississippi. While I was in a class on Southern food waves, which examined the culture, history, and impact of the way we eat, we discussed an article that attempted to trace the origins of chicken mall. As I read the article, I realized that I'd never once thought about mole critically. Where did it come from? What was it? And more importantly, why did it matter? I had seen signs advertising it outside of every Baptist or Methodist church, fire department, and men's club throughout Northeast Georgia my entire life, but I hadn't placed it into a larger context. And while I became the center of attention as the only person who had tasted this truly southern dish, I hadn't, and you could shed some more academic light upon it, I felt as the moment more than I understood at the time. I learned a few major things in that hot and sticky classroom. Firstly, chicken malt isn't really a thing outside of Northeast Georgia. The dish we know, a milky stew made from boiled chicken and pulverized soda crackers, is a unique feature to our region. It's a localism that defines our food ways and tells a tremendous amount about our culture. Secondly, the people of Northeast Georgia are the only people to say the word soda cracker. And thirdly, Southern food is an ever-evolving phenomenon, which while seemingly old-fashioned and stagnant, is constantly changing and becoming more than fried chicken and collard greens. This creates a fascinating conundrum for those who wish to preserve the traditional food ways in the face of change. When I returned to Athens in the summer of 2013, I fought a chicken mull again. <clears throat> I'd begun the Masters of Historic Preservation program at UGA, and started to expand my knowledge of the field. <coughs> I'd always assumed that historic preservation was all great crumbling mansions and fights over flooring and paint color. What I quickly discovered was the definition was broader and more inclusive, because it has to be. Preservation has to include more than just great feats of architecture, but rather more communities, cities, landscapes, and the intangible. I love exploding the definition of preservation. It reminds people interacting with the past and practitioners that our heritage can be seen in the gentle swell of an Indian mound, of an arts and crafts side table, and in the taste of chicken mall. The key to preserving these minute details and finding the work and the beauty of in their machinations. Let's talk for a minute about America's working definition of preservation. America has a fascinating paradigm of preservation that is not shared by the rest of the world. The American paradigm rests on the idea that we are preserving our history, fixing it in time. We throw around terms like restoration and preservation easily, forgetting that they are terms that freeze the past, making it unalive and unlivable. By using these terms, we are forcing ourselves to imagine house museums and pristine sitting rooms, not the livable structures and usable objects that surround us. 
There exists a shift, however, with terms like rehabilitation and renovation. We are starting to see our structures as more than just portals to the past, but rather spaces for the future. Our structures are legacies for the future, not just memorials to the bygone. Yet despite this shift, there is still an ignorance to the lifestyles and ephemera of the past. Library and museum sciences touch on this topic, noting that our past is documented so much more through our objects than mere written history. Items tell stories of past lives. We see much, so much more through popular texts, toys, images, clothing, and products than through the text, or as even as much as I hate to say it, buildings. But a deeper understanding of the past comes when they're combined in the context. The kitchen is better understood when placed on a timeline with its objects. Using the evolution of kitchen technology, uh, the timeline provides an understanding of our culture's journey towards modernity, revealing changing definitions of time, work, and design. Simply looking at the kitchen and its items reveals layers to the past. Looking at a preserved kitchen is simply just a row of fixtures. Adding, uh, adding items such as spoons, bowls, refrigerators, and microwaves changes it into a room and communicates clearly its function and usage in the home. Historic preservation and museums give us these interpretations. But what is missing are the elements provided by intangible resources, the things that make the room come alive. Whether this is food cooking on the stove, noise coming from the TV, or cultural events that are occurring, rooms are made livable by their events and residents. Preservation allows us to freeze time, place rooms behind glass, and understand them as casual observances. The additions of objects and small details merely add the illusion of life and allow us to see this version of the past that hardly seems real. Picture a house museum in its parlor. It's a room. There are sofas, pictures on the wall, a piano in the corner. It's a window to the past. You can imagine what it was like to live there, but you can't experience it. Except you can, in a sense, through intangible resources. Listening to the popular music of the era, sewing traditional embroidery patterns, or playing games allow us to more clearly experience the atmosphere of the past through more than just a perfectly maintained sofa. The most accessible way for us to interact with the past on a daily basis, in my opinion, is through food ways. Think back to your grandmother's kitchen. You may remember how it was set up, or her favorite bowl, or anything else, but what I can guarantee what you remember most is clearly is the taste of smell of whatever she was cooking. Food is a true gateway to the past. All of humanity must eat, and what we eat says a lot about us, where we're from, what we can afford, and how we interact with other cultures. It's a shared experience. It encompasses humanity. But food ways are also historic cultural resources. Food is an ever-evolving entity. It's constantly changing as trends, new methods, and new ingredients emerge. Old ways of preparation and taste fall out of vogue and out of memory almost as quickly as a dish can be prepared. Yet, as fleeting as a meal is, it's a sensory example of culture, time, and space, just as much as a building, a chair, or even a city. This brings me back to chicken mole. Chicken mole is a simple dish. In most cases, it has less than five ingredients. Chicken, broth, cracker meal, butter, and onions. To call it simple, however, is not to imply that it is easy or that it lacks depth, but rather that it is unpretentious, inexpensive, and homey. Its origin stems from the working classes of the Athens area, made by farmers, mill hands, and industrial workers. It holds calories and it fills fill stomachs. You won't find it in any fancy restaurant in Atlanta or in too many junior league cookbooks, but you will find it in every Baptist or Methodist cookbook from 1930 to 1980. That's where my next exploration began, in these old cookbooks. I love cookbooks. I get that from my grandmother, Dorothy Miller. The two of us can sit for hours and pour over recipes, comparing notes on whether a fourth of a teaspoon of baking soda or a half of a teaspoon really makes the difference in a good pound cake. And that's, so I went to her collection, looking through every cookbook, pulling out each recipe for chicken mold. And what I found was curious. I found 10 recipes originating from Clark, Oconee, Wilkes, Jackson, and Banks counties. Four of them were contributed by the same man, Mr. Roy Smith of Nicholson. His recipe used the most simple, 
which I guess helps it make, make it the most popular. It's also the truest to the colloquial understanding of the dish. My favorite publishing of his recipe is from the 2006 community cookbook, Nicholson Friends and Family Cook. It calls for 15 gallons of broth, 15 gallons of milk, meat from 35 cooked tins, two cups of salt, five tablespoons of black pepper, two tablespoons of red pepper, two ounces of red hot sauce, one pound of butter, and one 50 gallon stainless steel bag. The recipe continues. Thoroughly cook 35 hens, remove bones, fat, and skin, chop meat to desired texture, add ingredients together and bring to boil, let simmer for one hour, and serve with saltines. I like this one for a variety of reasons. Number one, Mr. Smith allows for some variation. He doesn't want to force someone into having meat a certain way or cooking the saltines in the broth. It's kind of a dealer's choice, if you will. And number two, Mr. Smith clearly states what size vat to cook it in. This is a new feature to the 2006 edition to the recipe. I can only imagine that after some feedback, it was necessary to clearly state what size monster we're working with here. But the recipes also feature other types of derivation. In a Minish family cookbook from Commerce, shrinks the recipe considerably. Rather than requiring a 50 gallon vat, this one serves only six to eight people. This recipe is similar, minus the red pepper and the hot sauce, and it crumbles the crackers in while cooking and thickens the soup. Another great version comes from Norma Alice of Washington, who suggests cooking the chicken with a few celery leaves to add a little flavor with some ground onion. Hers is unique in that it comes with serving suggestions. They could desire to desire consistency with crushed soda crackers. A little milk and more crackers will stretch this if necessary. Serve over toast in bowls as is. Potato salad and sliced tomatoes go well with this. Other derivations are more intense. The Athens New Covenant Worship Center cookbook adds crushed tomatoes, a canned cream style corn, potatoes, and onions. I hesitate to call this a real mold, but I am not in a position to judge. A Banks County Methodist Church cookbook also repeats the addition of corn and tomatoes. These variations speak to the fluidity of Southern food and its constant evolution from kitchen to kitchen and memory to memory. The very popular Oconee County cookbook, Recipes and Reminiscence, speaks to an early version of the dish, turtle mold. It's believed that chicken mold got its start with turtle meat, which fell out of vogue as sensibilities changed and wages rose. Turtle mold is an intense dish. Calling for a one to five pound hen plus chicken backs, one to five pounds of turtle meat, tomato juice can be omitted if necessary. Onions, crackers crushed by hand, pepper, milk, and butter. By my estimates, estimates it should take around four hours to prepare. The note at the close of the recipe reads, serve with slaw and saltines and barbecue sauce. Very delicious. I usually make a big wash pot full for 40 to 50 people. <laughs> the opposing page features an incredibly simple chicken mole recipe that is fairly traditional, as well as a seemingly bland recipe for hot chicken souffle. <coughs> what these cookbooks reveal is a dish that is highly personal, yet communal. The recipes are almost always from large groups, published in community and church cookbooks. They seek to serve massive quantities of people with few inexpensive ingredients. Yet they are personalized by each cook, adding in flavors to distinguish one preparation from another. This is the crux of food waste. Common dishes enjoyed across cultures, but with individual takes to define it as personal. What the recipe also tells us is that the preparation is communal as well. I had the pleasure of attending the annual chicken mole at Briarwood Baptist Church in Watkinsville this February, where the photos were taken for today. I just pulled up in the parking lot, asked if I could document the process, and was quickly invited in with open arms and eager answers. I spoke with the men in charge of the process and discovered why the dish is best prepared by something as large scale as a church. Arranged near their barbecue pit were rows of cut down, rusty oil barrels over small open flames. Black pots rested on top with rebar threaded through the handles for support. 
in these pots, boiled chicken broth with some milk and cracker meal. While we chatted, the men in the group ground massive containers of boiled and picked chicken into fine paste. Meanwhile, the women of the church picked the meat cleanly from the bones. The men informed me that the women performed this difficult task because the, their ability, their small hands and tiny fingers, went to a cleaner carcass. <laughs> Onions were ground as well and added to the broth from the chicken ones. <clears throat> they cooked over hickory because it gave the mull a better, smokier flavor. A seasoning of red pepper was added. <clears throat> that day it was floating to the top. Finally, three sticks of butter were dropped into each vat to begin the thickening process, which was uh, finished by further additions of ground crackers. Each vat was constantly attended to, stirred by a church member, most of whom were preteens. They served long paddles to prevent the scorching. The whole process took about 12 hours, and it's been happening for over 20 years. When I thought about chicken mull and intangible heritage preservation once again, I came to a conclusion. This dish, this process, this localism must be saved. It's already bleeding. My grandmother has multiple editions of the same cookbooks, and in the case of the Commerce City cookbook, the recipe appeared in two earlier volumes, but between the 1987 edition and the 1995, it was removed, already falling out of vogue in its key region. Newer cookbooks don't even mention it. Only two restaurants that I know of serve it. Mole season is shrinking. Once a weekly occurrence, fewer and fewer community sales are even happening. What is to be done? How can it be preserved? This is where the changing of the American paradigm comes into play. Where we want to freeze our heritage in time, other countries keep it living. They do so by using a different terminology, which I think is key. The rest of the English-speaking world uses the term conservation. It's akin to stewardship. The rest of the real world views their heritage as living, requiring documentation, minimal intervention, and reversible change. This ethic should be central to our idea of preservation. Instead of freezing our past, it should be living, breathing, ready for future generations to use and learn at the same time, not stagnant behind glass. The counterpoint to the American preservation paradigm is the approach taken by the international preservation community. Global cultural heritage activities have resulted in the creation of a UNESCO intangible cultural heritage list Beginning in 2001, a survey was begun to nominate and list those intangible items that have been defined, and that which have defined cultures and contributed to the global understanding of humanity. The Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage was drafted in 2003. 153 countries now participate, with 281 heritages listed. The foundation of this list is built upon the idea of safeguarding which means to ensure the viability of the heritage by continuous recreation and transmission. Safeguarding is all about the, not the transfer of knowledge, skills, and meaning. The Convention for Safeguarding Intangible Cultural Heritage realizes that not all intangible heritages will make it. Not all forms will survive change, but in their disappearances, they can give way for new forms of cultural expression. This shift occurs when they are no longer important to the community itself. The list is varied, featuring a variety of forms of intangible heritage. The first listed heritages were from common cultures across Central America, Africa, China, Eastern Europe, India, Italy, Japan, the Philippines, Spain, and Uzbekistan in 2001. The list expanded to further include other nations across the globe. Austrian Viennese coffee house culture was added in 2011. In 2014, Japan nominated washi, a form of traditional paper. The Panama hat was nominated from Ecuador. Twelve countries from across the globe nominated the tradition of falconry. They include Belgium, Czech Republic, France, Spain, Morocco, Mongolia, Qatar, the Republic of Korea, Saudi Arabia, the Slovak Republic, and the United Arab Emirates. The Galid tradition of Yoruba culture, found in Togo, Nigeria, and Benin, 
honors mothers through ritual dance and masks in order to celebrate female ancestors and the elderly in their power and influence. These traditions celebrate what defines these cultures and notes their contribution to the global understandings of humanity. This list also includes various foodways. While it took years for them to even be included in the survey, the addition to foodways is tapped into the necess necessity to safeguard their existence. 2010 saw the addition of traditional Mexican cuisine after three years of attempts. Turkish coffee joined the list in 2013. Italy, Spain, Greece, Morocco, Portugal, Cyprus, and Croatia nominated the Mediterranean diet in 2010. And the decorating of gingerbread called Ligatar was nominated from Croatia in 2010. And Armenia nominated the art and creation of Lavash, a traditional bread, in 2014. These food traditions have common threads, such as basic dishes and preparation methods common throughout all cultures, which speak to the permeability of food ways and the story of humanity. What you should note, of course, is the lack of North American nations on the list. While I won't take time to get into the politics that limit the participation of the United States and UNESCO programs, I will speak to the necessity of our participation in these global initiatives. By not participating, we are limiting our ability to nominate our forms of cultural heritage. And items like Southwestern Native American potteries, Gullah Geechee languages, Wisconsin dairy production methods, Amish furniture making, and even Northeast Georgia chicken mall cannot be safeguarded. Connections to our international heritages cannot be easily made, and shared values cannot be ascertained. With our societies trending towards globalism, American cultural heritage needs to be uh, preserved. Furthermore, by not participating in the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention, we are not aiding in the safeguarding of other cultural properties. We're not able to honor what created the melting pot of our cultures, essentially disrespecting other forms of cultural expression. We owe other heritages more than that. That is not to say that we ignore our own <coughs> cultural heritages. Stemming from the prevalence of car culture and the American travel mindset, the concept of cultural heritage tours have emerged. Popular tours such as the South Carolina Barbecue Trail, Mississippi Blues Tour, Native American Reservation Tours, the California Cheese Tour, the North American Furniture Trail, and the Pilgrim Heritage Trails throughout New England allow for elements of intangible heritage to be experienced. <clears throat> and this encourages visitors to stop off quickly and experience intangible resources in their context and by those who are deeply entrenched in each culture. It provides awareness of these cultures to visitors who take the experience home and transmit the knowledge. But we must ask ourselves, is this enough for our cultural heritage? When we look around and see perfectly maintained buildings and structures, do we also see fully documented and honored cultures? Or are things being lost in the great blending of our cultures? The National Park Service is starting to allow, allow for the intangible heritage to be nominated to the National Register, but only if it can be tied to a specific structure or building. Documentation can be completed on the resources from audio recordings of oral histories or film of craft production, and even in the stack of cookbooks I found with chicken mold. We can celebrate at festivals and honor German-American heritage, and we can fill up our stomachs, but will that lead to the safeguarding of our unique cultural heritage? I'm fundamentally not sure. But what I can say is we cannot allow our cultural heritage to cease to be important to the communities they represent. We must fight to transmit, transmit information generationally and preserve the intangible parts of our kitchens and parlors that define each space is space more than a room. We have to save the sights, the sounds, the smells, and the heritage of each space, especially if it matters to us. There's something else I realized when I thought about chicken mole before coming here tonight. I thought about your understanding of historic preservation. Most of you didn't realize that preservation went beyond buildings and structures. It's a community ethic that has to be fostered and maintained. 
It has more parts than holes. It's more than just a ha perfect house that the president sat in with expertly maintained wallpaper and upholstery. It's a phenomenon that can be found in the backyard of a church in a black iron pot with three sticks of butter. It's made from the things that define our existence and make us feel full at the end of our days. Thank you.
one meaning of mole is to grind finely. It is. And uh, that's this thing. Yeah, that's one of the other debated terms for it. <clears throat> I think there used to be a place called Bill's Barbecue that also served well. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's closed. I think that's really cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's what we heard recently. It was out there on 29 North at Fortson's Grocery. So has it reopened or will it be soon? <laughs> I don't know. We just heard that it was going to reopen, so we're waiting. Uh, when I drove back to <coughs> one day this week, you know, there were people outside working there, so it Good. seems okay. to be oh, really? yeah. It's kind of there on 29 where 106 goes yeah. off to the left if you're going oh. on way. Oh. Yes, sir? Has this piqued your interest or are you pursuing other vanishing yeah. food ways? Wow. Um, this is my current peaked interest, but I would love any other good vanishing food ways. I like to chase a horse that's already running out, so <laughs> I like to keep following it if anybody has any suggestions. Yes, ma'am. How did you find you get a hold of the cookbooks uh, from that far I pulled a lot from my grandmother, but there's also cookbooks available online. The University of Wisconsin has a really great scanned in digital repository of cookbooks from across the country, originating back as far as 1860. And so I was able to search those through a database. So you're saying this food, chicken ball, in this particular area of Georgia, it's not even Georgia, it's just yes. right here. Uh, Wisconsin, somebody in Wisconsin here? You're able actually to, to scan them in or mail them to them. They're serving as just a huge library collection. But it didn't start out with what they have, and they've just been really welcoming and growing it. Is it searchable by words? Um, yes, sir. Oh, wow. And by location, I believe. Mm -hmm. So mole is just right here. This iteration of it is what we know is mole. I mean, the term is thrown around in other places. Parts of North Carolina, North Carolina and South Carolina have something they call mole, but it's not this dish. This dish is exactly Yeah, it's exactly what we have here, and this is the only way it's done in this area. So. Yes, uh, there's something called jollop or hollop, I'm not sure, J A L O P, that you might look into. Some versions of that are very much like right. chicken mall, but not all of them. I know that there is one person here who cooks chicken ball, and I don't know if there are a lot. So I'm curious to know if there are people in the audience who prepared it, and if so, what led them to their interest in it, whether it was from church or anybody have <laughs> insight? <laughs> 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 Well, 
pound in the firehouse, a lot of them do it. And there's a superstition that you, if you make it, there's going to be a stem winder fire. And it's happened many times. So that's part of the tradition in Athens is you'll get a big fire if you make chicken mold. Um, <laughs> mind your pot. <laughs> <laughs> Very often. I wonder if some of these recipes are handed down by word of mouth rather than written in cookbooks. If you were just looking at cookbooks, maybe you're not getting the entire picture. It was, you know, if it's such an informal, you know, close thing, it may just be passed down from family to family, generation to generation, and nobody's going to actually put it in a cookbook. Yeah, it seems like when I was at uh, Broward Baptist for their chicken mole, the process was not very well structured in terms of the fact that one guy had the recipe in his mind, <laughs> he was the measuring cup, mm -hmm. and that it was just his hand dumping it in, mm -hmm. going that way, and so they just seemed to follow his lead. And so maybe that is the problem, is the fact that it's just one guy at every church who has the recipe in mind and hopes that somebody sticks around long enough and watches him to learn it. Homer uh, Hansford lived in the neighborhood where the preacher Briarwood Baptist Church lived. Uh, so that may be a connection there of how it got from Homer to that church. Um, building bridges here. Well, I'm from Northwest Georgia and I've never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> a testament to the map. <laughs> I just wanted to comment, Jordan. I live um, in northern Madison County and I'm surrounded by three families families who make rabbit mole and they all argue about how to make it. <laughs> so, so it's a you know it's a unique recipe to that little neighborhood of cooks but but they do it to the rabbit. That, does the rabbit mole also contain chicken? I have eaten it but I, I, I don't know. It was it was mostly salt crackers and that I can take. <laughs> 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 yeah, turtle, turtle, uh, usually, it, it's turtle added to chicken mold. Right. Mm -hmm. So maybe rabbit would be added to chicken. Possibly. Mm -hmm. I grew up in South Carolina about 30 minutes north of Augusta, and um, I guess Georgia. And we, there was a couple of barbecue places that had mold, and it was basically exactly what uh, out what we brought up there, but with barbecue sauce. Yeah, I found that in a few cases. I think that's the tomato issue. And usually the common discussion of where it appears in North Carolina and South Carolina is that it's a lot thicker and it's more akin to a stew. It's something that you would really classify as a stew as opposed to a rice. Yeah, mm -hmm. put it over rice. People will do that in the low country, just about anything. Did you run into any discussion about um, Brunswick stew and... and that type of thing as you're doing this because uh, you know there's uh, several places that sort of claim Brunswick stew as its mm -hmm. origin and I don't know if there's differences between the varieties or what but I don't think we had a bloodier class than the day we talked about Brunswick stew <laughs> um, we had a girl from the coast of Georgia and another girl from the coast of Virginia yeah. and they decided that almost a physical altercation was the only way to solve that <laughs> uh, that was almost as bloody as barbecue day, which uh, that day I'll never sleep well again after. <laughs> but um, I tried to avoid it. Yeah. And just to be honest, because it's so debatable and it's so complicated, and I didn't want to bog all y'all down with that yeah. nasty argument, but maybe that's a topic for another day, but it's a very intense one as well. Um, the UNESCO Convention for Intangible Cultural Heritage is just a program that's funded by UNESCO and maintained by them. <clears throat> and it encourages their member nations to nominate their process, very, their culture, similarly to how we do the National Register. And it goes before UNESCO and the convention, and they decide whether or not it's worthy to be included. And what they've come up with is those 281 cultural heritages that are okay. And that's kind of what they're doing, it's really great method. Uh, they usually shoot 
um, quick documentaries that are listed on their website, and they really try to document the process with those who create it. So they're going and filming it, taking audio histories, photographs, and in case of crafts, original pieces, and preserving those for future generations. And you're saying the United States hasn't been involved in it? No, they, we don't currently participate. Do you know why not? <laughs> um, it's a very complicated political situation, <laughs> and I don't want to, <coughs> so it's pretty easily figured out. <laughs> So are you familiar with Slow Food International? They have a thing called the Ark of Taste, and they preserve food waste from around the world. The, um, the United States participation has been limited because they've been through three presidents in like four years at the national level. Mm -hmm. but, in, but look at Slow Food International, Perfect. and they have um, quite a few things where they're preserving um, certain cheeses. There was we got to a point where there were only three people left in a little village in Austria that knew how to make this one particular cheese. And the winemakers of Verona went in together and sponsored having an intern going in to make that cheese. So they're very active worldwide, and it's not a political thing like UNESCO. Perfect, I'll look into that. Anything else? 